We're creating one of the most unique shows on television, and we want to give you exclusive weekly updates on that process and find ways for you to vote on what happens and create opportunities to include you in it. So that's really exciting. I'm trying to create the experience that I would have killed for as an up-and-coming creator. And you'll see this theme pop up over and over in the coming months. Sometimes you need outsiders and underdogs to shake up the way things have always been done. As you'll see in this episode and the episodes to come, we wanted to shake things up with gaming films because historically they have not been great. We also wanted to shake things up with American anime. We wanted to tell a story about content creators and the future of gaming that everybody can relate to. And we're, we're doing that. I mean, the team now is so freaking talented. Mike Ryan has been a writer and a showrunner for over two decades. He's brought to life shows like Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Laboratory, King Julian, Scooby-Doo, Batman, The Avengers. He's a force of nature. And we also have two Emmy award-winning producers, Michael and Katie, an Oscar-nominated director, and so many more talented individuals who you will meet in the coming weeks right here on this series. And my team would kill me if I hint at who our composer is. And the same goes for leaking our Hollywood talents and our other YouTube creators that you'll be seeing. But suffice it to say, this is going to be huge. But this project did not happen overnight. And with this series, I wanted to take you on the journey of how Ghost of Ruin came to life. I'm not a child of Hollywood nepotism, and I wasn't born with a silver spoon. I've mostly just been a broke content creator for most of my life. And so this is my first TV show. And so if you'll allow me to be vulnerable, um, some days I still wake up terrified that I'm going to let down our amazing team, or even worse, that I'll let you guys down. I've also been keeping video diaries of this as a form of therapy for the last two years. You'll, I'll be showing some of them and you'll see I've been crying or working until 3 a.m. on this, even while I had COVID. The road to getting this greenlit has not been easy. But rather than start with this series, jumping straight into storyboards and casting and all the awesome things the team's working on this week, I wanted to go back to the very beginning. Our show is about an underdog gamer who risks everything for his dreams. And that's my story as well. And if I don't tell my story, I'm doing you a disservice because I want you to walk away from this series knowing that you too can have a vision, rally a team around that vision, and together you can achieve the impossible. In film school, they talk about the hero's journey or the story circle. This is a common framework for nearly every story we see on television. The hero starts in a zone of comfort, but they want something. They enter an unfamiliar situation and they adapt to it. They get what they wanted, but they pay a heavy price. And then they return to their familiar situation, having changed. I want you to learn about that story for myself in this project. And I want you to see yourself in this story. I want you to move further around that circle and get closer to your dreams. And by the end of the series, I think we're all going to find out that we're a lot more alike than we think. So let's start with the beginning of the story for Ghost of Rowan, which means we need to start with the beginning of my story. We were pretty poor growing up. I was a third generation Italian growing up in a rundown part of Florida. When I was in middle school, I had developmental issues and a few significant traumas that happened to me that made me retreat to video games as a source of comfort and just like in search of that feeling of belonging. Pokemon Snap, specifically, was my source of refuge. I was kind of obsessed with taking photos of Pokemon. And so when I got to high school, um, I got my first job working at a thrift store. And they sent all the proceeds that the store made to overseas nonprofits. And they encouraged me that I should go on these summer long trips. So my parents got me a camera and I soon found myself in Africa, applying the same photography skills that I picked up in Pokemon Snap, like the rule of thirds, framing, mid-ground, foreground, background, and I applied that to people in real life. And so after I came back, I worked at that thrift store every day after school. I saved every dollar that I could so I could spend my summers in various countries, such as Panama, Morocco, India, and Egypt. And I'll never forget the beautiful people I met and the ways we were able to shed some light on some amazing work that these nonprofits were doing. I didn't really care about schools, sports, or chasing girls. 
I just lived for those summer trips. And candidly, it's worth noting that I found out later that I didn't really feel safe, and I guess I just didn't feel like I could express myself at home. In fact, it's still hard to talk about this with my parents. I, I think they did their best, but the only way that I could cope with some of the things I was struggling with in high school is by expressing myself through my camera or through video games. So not long after graduating high school, I moved to Africa having no idea what would come next. There was a hospital ship called Mercy Ships and they would go into villages and find people with tumors and cataracts and bring them back onto the ship to do life changing surgery. I'm not gonna say we were the original Mr. Beast, but we were doing that way back before it was cool. It wasn't long before my photography on the ship was featured in National Geographic. I mean, think about that for a second. Pokemon Snap to National Geographic. It's pretty crazy, right? So this opened the door for me to do documentary work over the next 10 years. I worked at a nonprofit in Thailand where they helped women leave the red light district to become a hairstylists. And then I went to Ireland where they had a mentorship program for inner city kids by teaching them surfing. I also met my amazing wife, Charlene, and we adopted the world's greatest dog, Sherlock. Most days, we feel like he rescued us. Times definitely were always tight, but the work that I was doing really felt like we were making a big impact. It was always important for me to be telling stories on an ongoing basis, but also to empower up and coming storytellers on how they can find their voice. It was awesome. I had a lot of fun working on some crazy projects in my 20s. But as good as it was, it did still feel like something was missing. I loved video games and I loved the movies, but there wasn't a clear path to telling those kind of stories. There wasn't a clear path in telling my story. And then we went viral on YouTube. Voice over Pete recently got banned from Fiverr. We need to help Voice over Pete back. It should strike you as no surprise that my dad loved theater and encouraged me to act as well. He never made it to Hollywood, but he found a calling later in life doing Fiverr promos as a green screen spokesperson. About four years ago, one of his videos was about John Wick stealing your mom's credit card info to get the dub on Fortnite. It went viral. In fact, it became so popular that we think Epic Games pressured Fiverr into banning my dad from the platform. He ended up getting banned on Fiverr, but the problem is my dad had been doing that for five plus years. He was doing great and he was on track for that being his retirement plan. But the internet kind of broke that. So I told my dad, let's create a YouTube channel. Maybe they'll be sympathetic. Maybe they'll subscribe. And they did. PewDiePie told his community about our plight, and by the end of the week, we had 500,000 subscribers. In one freaking week, it was crazy. Once again, I had no idea what would happen next, or what kind of content that we would create for the channel. But a friend introduced me to Ryan Ramsey, and he asked if he could write scripts for us and see if the community liked that style of content. And Ryan wrote some weird episodes. But some of them turned out to be pretty funny. We called them cinematic memes. Over the next six months, we worked with some incredible YouTubers and we finally reached the legendary milestone of 1 million subscribers. And then the pandemic hit. We couldn't go out, we couldn't film content. And I was trapped in my house for weeks, playing endless battle royales and video games with Ryan. And I asked him why hadn't anyone made a movie about a battle royale video game? It seems like it would be so much fun, right? Like you could set it in the future about the world's most awesome game turning into this deadly nightmare. And Ryan agreed. He said, maybe we could spend the next year writing the first draft. Who knows what might happen? And then a week later, totally out of the blue, a buddy of mine told me that he knew a Chinese investor that wanted to finance an American movie to write off $40 million before the year's end for tax purposes. I can't make this up. Like, uh, once again, I had no idea what would happen next. So my buddy asked me, do you know anyone who's got a blockbuster film script? So naturally I said, yeah, I know the perfect script and it'll, it'll be the next hit movie. In fact, it's almost finished. He said, great. Can you send it to me a month? <laughs> no problem. So then I freaked the fuck out, and I called Ryan. 
Dude, we've got four weeks to write this. Are you game?